Thank you, uh, Colin, for sharing that. And uh, uh, yeah, yeah, the dream was interesting and it's definitely about transformation and in line with uh, <clears throat> the team that we have today. We have touched on um, what it means to be born again in the spirit. And last week, we talked about the born again soul. Today, as I have announced the topic from last Sunday, that we are talking about the born again physical body. And as I meditated on these uh, messages, I uh, have uh, sort of waited on the Lord. And one of the questions that I have um, asked of the Lord is, if what we have believed and received from the revelations and scriptures is true that there's a three-part second coming, <clears throat> and while I speak, uh, Colin, if you can find the chat again, or three parts again coming. If that is true, then there must be uh, more scriptures that point to the transformation and what we call the transfiguration in the days of the ten toes when the kingdom of God is um, revealed to this earth. And that is the synopsis of what we call the born again body. When our body receives a transformation and the resurrection life and becomes not just a body, a normal physical body of flesh and blood, but becomes a transformed and transfigured physical body. Jesus was, of course, transfigured for a purpose. And um, <clears throat> the purpose of the transfiguration is in order to show us what the end time uh, transformation can be. Right, we have the chart coming up. And uh, <clears throat> in this chart, we have deduced that through the scriptures that the second coming of Jesus is not just in two parts, but in three parts. At first, when, um, when scholars were looking at the second coming of Jesus, they keep seeing only one Grand Slam second coming. And that is the second coming in Zechariah 14 at the end of the tribulation. Some Christians still see only one Grand Slam second coming. But as we approach more and more the 20th century, we begin to see from the Reformation period in Martin Luther to the revivals of John Wesley, George Whitfield, many theologians have begun to see a two-part second coming. And that is a differentiation between the rapture and the landing of Jesus on the earth. So it became clearer and clearer that the scriptures can be divided into two different second comings, part A and part B. And after this um, end time move began, which is February the 9th, 2012, as God began to speak to us and pour down revelations and we have re-examined the scriptures, we began to see a three-part second coming. We see a part A as Jesus coming to his church in the kingdom of God being established in Daniel 2.44 in the days of the ten toes. And then there is the rapture. And then the second coming of Jesus landing on the Mount of Olives. So we see a three-part second coming. When we look at Jesus' first coming, the Jews only saw a, what I call a single second coming. And to the Jews, the, the, the first coming, that is, to the Jews, they didn't see the first and second coming. To the Jews, they only saw one coming of the Messiah and then full stop, the end. But as we saw Jesus came and went, we realized that there is actually a three part of his coming. That is, there is a part to the Jews, 
and then three years later to the Gentiles, and then the fulfillment of the restoration of Israel as a nation, which was much, much later, even in the year 1948. So the restoration of Israel, the coming of Jesus for the Gentiles, and the coming of Jesus for the Jews were like uh, a three-part first coming that the Jews did not see. And then one of them was very separated from the first and second part, first coming of Jesus. In fact, the Jews never saw that there was a second coming. The Jews only saw one grand slam coming of the Messiah, the end, full stop. The Jews could not see that there was a period of the Gentiles that will last 2,000 years. The Jews could not see that it would take them nearly 2,000 years later before they come together as a nation. For at the time of Jesus coming, they were under the Roman Empire. They were never a nation at all. And even after they were destroyed, and they even lost Jerusalem as a capital, and they were scattered, and they became the uh, diaspora of the Jews. They never came together until 1948, after the Second World War. And by then, they have even lost their mother tongue uh, of Hebrew. It became a dead language which no human being speaks anymore. And they were speaking a mixture of uh, languages close to Aramaic and Yiddish. So the Jews did not see all those things. That even in the first coming of Jesus, to, for the Jews, for the Gentiles, which is separated by three years of his ministry, and then to establish their nation. They could not see that these things must take place as part of his first coming. They were even asking the question in Acts chapter 1 when he was about to be ascended. He says, what about Israel? The Messiah is supposed to restore Israel. And Jesus told them that uh, it's not for them to worry about these things. Just receive the power of God and um, that these things have their own season and time. So we do know that Jesus does have to fulfill every scripture that is in the Bible in going restoring Israel. But all these timelines that they could not see, that there was, a, there was a time when he has to come for the Jews to fulfill his uh, first part coming, which they could not see there was a first part, second coming. That there was a time of the Gentiles that lasted 2,000 years. I mean, from reading the Old Testament, you could see the time of Gentile could be interpreted to last, let's say, a few years or seven years or 10 years or 40 years, whatever. But it's lasted 2,000 years. And that there is a restoration of Israel together as their own nation and with their own language, which today we know to be Hebrew, a revival of the dead language, which they foresaw but they never realized it would take another nearly 2,000 years before it takes place. So there are some uh, blurness in their view of the coming of the Messiah. Just like for the church, we have lasted nearly 2,000 years and we realize there is a second coming because it's not fulfilled yet. All the scriptures of the Old Testament predicting of his coming, including Jesus landing on the Mount of Olives, Jesus coming in judgment, and uh, the Mount of Olives splitting the two, Zechariah chapter 14. So we realize that there was this grand slam second coming. Then over 2,000 years, the closer we look, and adding especially Pauline revelation. It was very, very difficult to see the rapture in the Old Testament scripture. It is there. It is in allegorical form. How Enoch was taken before the flood and uh, many pictures or allegory of uh, rapture. But it was not easy to see it based on Old Testament scriptures alone. You need revelation to see it. But Paul was especially given the revelation of the rapture. 
And you see him talking about that in 1 Corinthians 15, in uh, 1 Thessalonians 2, 2 Thessalonians, and then uh, in uh, 2 Timothy. And in all the ways, scriptures, Paul had a revelation of the rapture clear and with clarity. And Paul's writing, which was very revolutionary at that time, because he saw the newborn again experience, that one does not have to go back to the law in a way that no Jew could see. And in Paul's time, there was no scripture on what he said. It was his revelation that he recorded down. But thankfully today, Paul's writings have become part of the New Testament. So we acknowledge it as scripture. And so we have a set of scriptures very strong, including the Gospels, that Jesus' second coming included a separate rapture from his landing on the earth. And then here comes the end time revival, where we have glimpses of prophecy in people like uh, Kenneth Hagin, who saw and spoke about Jesus saying to him, he will come to the church before he come for the church, before he come with the church. Then we realize, the more we examine it, that there is a but three-part second coming, not just a two-part. And we are presenting the, the three-part second coming, which uh, uh, there were some early theologians in the 2,000 years of Christianity who sort of saw something like the church becoming so powerful, it becomes like a kingdom and empire. But they didn't know where to fit it in. And so in uh, talking about theological history of the church, as I study theology, that, um, that these early people who saw something about the glorious kingdom of God didn't know where to put it, and so they put it as equal the millennium. And when they put it as equal the millennium, it has to be pre-tribulation and not just post-tribulation, that is until, uh, and, and they didn't know how to interpret John's, uh, revel John, John the Apostle's revelation, which put it after the tribulation. So they said, okay, the timeline can be shifted and that was just an allegory, so they move it forward. And they are known uh, and, and they are known as what I call uh, the, uh, the post-millennial view, which is, which is now uh, not, not very well uh, presented because many people don't believe that. And, um, uh, and you, what you have is um, that uh, you have a Pre-millennial, which means uh, the millennium is after the tribulation. You have a post-millennial, uh, which is talking about its position in, um, in the area of, um, of uh, the tribulation. So whether the tribulation is before the thousand years or tribulation is after the thousand years, that's post-millennial, or there's no such thing as a thousand years, which is our millennial. So for those of you who love theology, there are three theological views on the thousand years. Uh, pre, post, and R. R is the English word added like the Greek to negate it. R millennia are people who don't believe in the thousand years and just say that it's something just symbolic and there's no such thousand years. But uh, they don't take revelations literally, even though the thousand years are mentioned. And one of my uh, Greek professors in uh, Baptist Seminary in Penang, he holds an R millennial view. And so I've been exposed to that view. And I have read out on post millennial also people who sees the church growing until it's such a great power base before the, the, uh, the tribulation. But then as uh, the scientific age came and then as uh, we began to see that the church is not that successful in um, uh, reaching the world and ruling the world uh, because of corruption. Uh, when Christianity came to the Roman Empire, it became corrupt. When Christianity uh, went into Europe and England was a base, and you can see that uh, Christians don't behave like Christians, and some are Christian in name without being born again, and there's corruption in the church. And then it goes to USA, became the base for evangelism. At first, it was very good. It was founded based on freedom of religion by the Pilgrim Fathers' uh, vision. 
and then through the many years or two uh, 200 to to three two to three hundred years of existence of USA, we saw how the Bible was thrown out and no more acknowledged as the uh, holy book, but instead they begin to accept all religions and. Uh, uh, and so things began to change. Then we realized, wow, wow, the Christianity is not like like conquering, ruling as it was supposedly supposed to be in the vision and dream of Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar. And so the post-millennial view fell out. But what I believe is the post-millennial people who saw something were seeing what we understand to be the part A. There is part A, B, C. The part A of the kingdom of God coming, which is a short period of time before the rapture, when the church reaches its fullness, when the church dominates all of the earth uh, and, and show forth the fullness of Jesus' redemption. That is the part A that we see. And so when Jesus comes to his church, and then we realize the more we examine the scriptures and the more I realize, especially when the Lord gave me uh, his understanding that uh, I will not die, but give me the exact date where I'll be raptured up before the official rapture. And then I begin to see other things happening, which I have meditated on those scriptures. And then uh, uh, in the end, the understanding of Daniel chapter 2 verse 44 and the three-part uh, authority given in Daniel 7 became clear. There's a part where the church was always under the dominion of uh, the enemy, always in warfare and not really doing a good job at that. Then there was a decree of the ancient of days that it's time for the saints to take the kingdom, which Paul also saw in Hebrews chapter 12 when uh, we receive the kingdom of God. And uh, which Jesus saw and spoke about of the kingdom of God coming in power in his transfiguration, which Peter talks about when he referred to the transfiguration time, that that is the kingdom of God coming in power. And that has nothing to do with the rapture, but something separate by itself. And uh, we begin to see more and more clearer. And that's the part we, that I realized that there is a time when the church is transformed, spirit, soul, and body. And you have scriptures like Ephesians 5, where the church is without, without, um, uh, without um, wrinkle and without spot, that I believe hints not just as a spiritual allegory, but a physical picture of the church receiving a physical transformed body even before the rapture. So we already have a compilation of scriptures that point to this concept that today we present to you, Jesus comes to his church called the born again body. So that's where we are talking about uh, in theology wise, in Bible history and in church history. Thank you, Colin, for that. And we can take it with the chat now that you have the picture that uh, we're speaking of the part A, which for us is Jesus comes to his church. And um, we have given you actually a lot of scriptures. Uh, in our study of the kingdom of God, we have related all the transfiguration, transfiguration scriptures in Matthew, Mark, and Luke that points to the kingdom of God coming in its power. So I won't repeat that. Uh, so already we have a, a big group of scriptures uh, that included the kingdom of God uh, coming in power and in the days of uh, Daniel. And I think there's a whole group of scriptures, the transfiguration scriptures, the book of Daniel scriptures, and then you have uh, the perfect church scriptures like Ephesians 4 and Ephesians 5. And um, so you have this, uh, the scriptures that point to uh, what I call a new body in the church manifest before the, before the rapture. And today, I want to add more scriptures to that from the perspective of what I call the born again body. And I've been asking a lot, Lord, uh, this area that I understand to be the kingdom of God coming and studying it and presenting it from the kingdom of God give you give a lot of scriptures. Uh, many scriptures about the kingdom of God showing the perfection of your people. Now that we know the kingdom of God is fulfilled in the church and not in Israel. And um, they have a type and form of that, but they don't have it in fullness like the church, the new Israel of God. 
And so uh, we understand when we study under the kingdom of God, I want, I want to assure you and encourage your faith uh, that when we study under the kingdom of God, you can easily prove it. Many, many scriptures that there's a part A second coming that was never seen clearly under this end time. But now I want to take another approach. The approach from the salvation point of view in uh, salvation point of view, and that is the born again, what it means to be born again. Now, when you look at the kingdom of God, you realize that to be born again is the, is the requirement to see the kingdom and to enter the kingdom. So that in itself tells us that in order to see physically and experience physically some sort of a born again concept definition can be applied to our experience of the salvation of God. In the end, we are to be born again in a spirit, soul, and body. So here goes uh, on, on where our, our definition comes. So that you know that these definitions or concepts that are presented using Bible language actually comes from the Bible itself. Uh, but never seen or presented in that manner. Like in John chapter 3, it says in verse 3, Jesus says, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now you can talk about spiritual seeing. But if Daniel 2.44 speaks about a physical manifested kingdom, because all the other kingdoms before are physical, and you cannot really call the Babylonian Empire, Middle Persian, Greek, and Roman spiritual empires. They were physical empires, which imply in Daniel 2.44 that in the days of the Tentos, that God established a physical manifestation of the kingdom of God. <clears throat> so here, if we are to physically see, not just spiritually see the kingdom of God, the born again has to, in a way, transform our physical body. For Paul himself says in 1 Corinthians 15, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Can you see the forbidding scriptures that you also wrestle with? I read to you that scripture. And uh, <clears throat> uh, from the scripture that Colin was sharing earlier with, he, after presenting all the different uh, definitions from his point of uh, the resurrection power, he equals resurrection of the body as the kingdom of God. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Now that tells you clearly, if you are logical and you prove that the kingdom of God has to manifest before the rapture. And then you have this scripture that says, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. What is the logical conclusion? That there must be a transformation in those who inherit the kingdom of God and manifest it. That our bodies are not limited to just being flesh and blood. There has to be a level of incorruptibility, immortality, and transformation of the physical body because it's the physical body that's hindering the kingdom of God fully manifesting. Can you see the logic that uh, the kingdom of God cannot be experienced fully or, or received by this physical body, old physical body? Thus, there are scriptures that show that the kingdom of God will manifest in the days of the ten toes and like Jesus' transfiguration coming in power. But the two doesn't come together. So you can only conclude that if one excludes the other and both cannot exist at the same time, then if the scriptures show that the kingdom of God has to manifest in the days of the Tentos, which we know only lasts in our time, and if the kingdom of God comes, it cannot have flesh and blood like the ordinary sinful body to inherit it, 
then the only way is for the sinful body to be transformed and changed by the power of God so there is no more the body that we know. It's a new body that can enter into the kingdom of God, which we call the born again body. For unless you're born again, Jesus says, you cannot enter, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Now in verse 5 or John chapter 3, he says, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water, that is the word, and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Wow, we can't even enter. Of course, we understand from Luke 17 that the kingdom of God is within us. But our question is that we don't have a problem with the kingdom of God within us. The problem we have is when does the kingdom of God within us become the kingdom of God outside us? And for that process, from the scriptures in John chapter 3, we call it, using this definition, the born again body. Born again in your spirit, born again in your, in your soul, born again in your body to fully experience the kingdom of God. Because we humans are tripartite. <clears throat> if only your spirit is born again, you can only experience in your spirit the kingdom of God. This is Jesus' requirement, born again. If then your soul and your body cannot experience it. But as your soul is a born again soul, then your spirit and your soul can experience the kingdom of God. But not your body. Because flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. But as your spirit and soul and body are born again, then you experience the kingdom of God, spirit, soul and body. And that should be normal because we are tripartite in nature. Never in the Bible will God exclude a part of our reality. We live in the reality of the spirit, the soul, and the body. So do we have what we call the evidence of the newborn body. But like many of us, we ask, faith is a spiritual substance. What's the evidence of faith? If you chop a person up to pieces, you cannot find the spiritual substance. But if a person of faith lives, he, he or she will behave differently from other people because they believe in things hoped for. They believe in things unseen. So it has an effect upon their belief system. And they bring forth the substantiating, creating a substance from things hoped for, evidence of things not seen. Hebrews 11 was one. In the same way, what's the evidence of the new soul? What's the evidence of the new body? Evidence of the new soul is how a part of us now have the mind of Jesus, the emotions of Jesus, or what, the, what we call the splagna of Jesus, and we have the will of Jesus in us. Where is God in Philippians 2 who causes us to will and to do? So the will of God finally is a part of us that we pray in the Lord's Prayer, God's will be done in heaven on, on, on earth. So the will of Jesus, the emotions of Jesus, the strength of Jesus, and the, uh, what I call the mind of Jesus is somewhere in us. And we need to tap upon it in order to flow into the soul of Jesus. But there's one more part that we present to you today. There must be some evidence of the new body in us. And to encourage each one of you, to let you know that you're moving into that, one of the evidence of the newborn body working in your life is it's very, very, very hard for you to fall sick. It's very, 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 very difficult to be sick. Whereas it's normal for the world. <clears throat> and when your hands 
are laid upon sickness and disease, your hands through the power of God can transmit power through your physical body so that it dries out sickness and disease when you lay hands. These are all circumstantial evidences that there's something in our physical body that is different. And there's Bible verses that show that our body is no more a body of sin. Although Paul calls it that in Romans 7. Our body is now the temple of the Holy Spirit. So in my first point and presentation to you today, I want to be very accurate theologically that the definition of the newborn body, although not fully manifest yet when a person is born again, is there in seed form. So the question today is not whether we have it, is how much of the seed form has grown into us to transform us towards the resurrected body that is our right and inheritance in God. The question is not whether we have it. The question is how much of the seed of the newborn body, the DNA, is transforming our physical body. So is this theological concept biblical and correct? Let's look more. After you see how Jesus emphasizes what being born again is, that to, to experience all its fullness, spirit, soul, and body, that born again effect has to affect you, spirit, soul, and body proportionally. Looking at the book of Romans, in chapter 7, Paul identifies all the reasons for the struggles against sin. He boils it down to one thing, that sin is present in the physical body and affecting our soul and our body. So here he says in Romans chapter 7, it says here, <clears throat> verse 5, Romans 7. For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. Which means when you were born under Adam, even 1 Corinthians 15 tells you that you're born into death. And Romans tells us in Romans 5 that death reigns. Death reign. Well, let's look back two chapters. In Romans 5, it says here in verse 14, through one man sin entered the world, and through one man death entered. And in verse 12, this death has spread to all men, because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We were born in sin. Romans 5, 5, verse 13, 14. Now, these theological concepts that are presented, and if you want all the detailed scriptures on the kingdom of God equals the resurrected body uh, before the rapture, in the earlier series of this series of end time scriptures where we cover the kingdom of God, I already laid that out. So I don't relay the same foundation. I'm building on the concept of new concept of born again body in seed form in us. So uh, refer to that sermon and then come back to this if you need to uh, understand all these concepts theologically. And in my presentation, it will be like what they say of Paul's teaching, what Peter said. There are some things that are spoken that are hard to comprehend. And people who just pick pieces of it here and then run away with it can, can misunderstand it totally to their own destruction. And uh, they don't understand. And someone who hears a part of this sermon say, well, he's saying we got born again body, born again body now. I didn't exactly say that. 
I said we had a seed form that will grow into the fullness. And, uh, <clears throat> and it, we have to accept that as a concept. Just as we say, we have to accept the concept that we have a new soul and that new soul needs to be nourished, to be trained in order to function in the power of the new soul, just as a part of the spirit. And so understand this, and I have backed up everything I say, including the definition from the Bible. In the Bible, I'm giving you Bible scriptures. The only thing is, many people have not seen the Bible presented in this manner. And uh, <clears throat> so we continue the concept. In uh, uh, Romans chapter 5, it says in verse 14, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam. So you say, yes, death is reigning. But I have one question for you here. Why did he mention from Adam to Moses? Why not from Adam to now, in his time? Why did he stop at Moses? Didn't death reign after Moses too? Because Moses himself died, Aaron also died before him, and then Joshua died, every man of God it has come after Moses have died. <clears throat> but why did he mention up to, up to Moses? Why not he say from Adam to now? Because you must understand the theology of Paul. Paul in Galatians says that because of sin, God gave the law to hold back sin for some time. See, is this concept correct? Yes. In, let's look now at Galatians. In Galatians 4, his presentation. My presentation is simple, but the concepts are deep. So please, hear every scripture. Don't take anything out of context. He presents the concept of his understanding of what the law came. Why did God give the law? And so he says in Galatians 4, he says um, <clears throat> that uh, in the fullness of time, God sent his son. Of course, we know why Jesus came. That uh, to, to bring forth something new in us. And then he tells us in Galatians 4, at first there were these struggle of this covenant. And then he says here that uh, there was a struggle between the law and grace. Mount Sinai uh, representing Hagar and uh, grace representing Sarah. But he talk, he's presenting that Jesus came and changed something. We all know Jesus came and changed something. He gave us a born again experience as you saw. In the fullness of time, in chapter 4, verse 4, uh, in verse 3, we were in bondage before. But now in chapter 4, verse 4, in the fullness of time, Jesus came. Now, we know why Jesus came. It's well established in the, in the New Testament and in evangelical concept about Jesus and what he came to bring us, the life of God, eternal life, and, uh, and the grace of God, salvation in all his fullness. But chapter 3, now look at chapter 3. Why did God give the law? Uh, chapter 3, let's read from verse 16. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say to seeds, but to single one. Of course, we know he referred to Isaac, but now he says he referred to Jesus. Uh, that's the way Paul interpreted the Bible. Interesting, isn't it? He points out, hey, actually hidden behind Isaac is Christ. And uh, that's how, because Paul only had an Old Testament scriptures to present New Testament doctrine. So he used every part that he could. In verse 17, and I say that the law, which was 430 years later, <coughs> cannot annul the covenant that was confirmed by God in Christ, in Abraham. And then he says in verse 19, then what, why did God give the law? Why did God bring the law in Moses' time? Good question. He answers that. In chapter 3, verse 19, it was added because of sin or transgression. It was added until Christ came. So before Jesus came, 
sin was destroying human, destroying human so great that God added the law and the law held it. The law held it until Jesus should come. That's Paul's presentation. And um, so it was added in verse 19 because of sin, because of transgression, because of destruction that was happening. We, we would have gone back to the time of Noah, if not for the law. And so the law was given and was appointed to angels by the hand of mediator. And the, now mediator doesn't mediate for one, but for God. And then <clears throat> verse 21, is the law against the promise? He says, no. The law <clears throat> in verse 24, uh, verse 23, before faith came, faith came in Jesus' time. We were kept under God by the law, kept for the faith which would afterward be revealed. Therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith, but after faith has come, we no longer need a tutor. So that's why Christ fulfilled the law. We live above the law now. In Paul's concept, the law came to hold back the the destruction of sin in humanity. It was holding something back. Now, let's go back to Rome, uh, Romans chapter 5. If that is so, in Paul's theology understanding, he knew what the law came to do. Now, in verse 14, he says, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses. Why did he present Moses? Because from Moses' time, as the law came, and God in His mercy allowed the law to come in all the civilizations. But it came not through Moses, it might come through their philosophers, through, through good men who, who reached out to seek a truth and God revealed truths of the law. And you find that the law is present in even the time of the Sumerians or the, uh, and the time of, in India of its uh, religious people and through uh, in China and in, in different, different uh, uh, cultures. There is somewhere, someplace where the law came in to hold back sin. So God in His mercy allow it to spread. So for some reason, and of course, where the law is diminished, then in those cultures, sin is a bit more. Because it's the law that will help to hold back sin. And so those who sin by the law, the law kills them all. They are eliminated before they cause more harm. That's why the law is very fierce, very strict. And uh, so we, we know the answer to why Paul says from Adam to Moses. Because in Moses, in his theological concept, the sin is held back by the grace of God. It's held back until Jesus come. So it ruled and ruled and ruled until the law came. It was like in, in a holding mode. It can't reign more. Whatever it has conquered up to the law, that was it. It was held back by the presentation of the law until Jesus came. Now, then Jesus came and brought us the gift of righteousness, of course. And um, then he talked about resurrection power working in us. And as resurrection power worked in us, we struggle because we are spirit, soul, and body. And so Paul says, I delight in the law. Yet something is working against me. So the tripartite struggle begins. Now, if you don't believe in the newborn against soul, a newborn against uh, body, then why is there a struggle? The struggle ceases. Peace comes when spirit, soul, and body are touched. Finally, the struggle ceases. And now it's a matter of growth. So here in Romans 7, he speaks about the struggle between the spirit, the soul, and the body. That's what Romans 7 is about. The struggle between spirit, soul, and body. <clears throat> so he recognized the law is holy. But the law keeps showing the evil side. The law brought an awareness of sin. And being aware of sin, we are suddenly like struck, stunned. And uh, then, then it tried to take occasion to increase. But now we know about it and there's a struggle against it. 
that was not there before the law came. And then he says, uh, how, 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 is, how is it that there's this struggle, he, he, he says. And he used words like, the law is spiritual. I'm so under sin. Verse 15, what I'm doing, I do not understand. What I will to do, I do not practice. What I hate that I do. If then I do what I will not do, I agree with the law that is good. But it's no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. So he identified two things. He identified that sin is in the body. In verse 18. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells for to will is present with me. But how to perform what is good, I do not find. Now, if to will shows his spirit willing and probably his soul also wants to will, but he could not. And there's a struggle between the body and the, and the spirit. And that struggle causes the soul to be overwhelmed at times. So he reached a conclusion. If sin is in the body, as the Bible says, isn't it clear to you that the day we are born again, something has to touch the body? It cannot be left as it is. Something must touch the body, otherwise the struggle will continue. So he says in verse 21, I find then a law that, is, that evil is present with me. And that's a horrible thing to, to, to live with evil. The one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. So there's a part here that delights in the law of God. But I see another law in my members, and this is full flesh now. There's a war on his inside. There's a law, there's a law in my members. My body is under a certain law. Warring against the law of my mind. My mind is under another law. And then in verse 22, my spirit is there delighting in the law of God. So there's a war. There's an internal war going inside and trying to pull me to sin. And verse 24, Paul says, Oh, wretched man that I am. And look at his struggle. Who will deliver me from this body of death? Who will save me from my sinful body? Now, he's not asking to be saved spiritually. He's not asking to be saved in his soul. He's asking how can he be saved from his own body. Correct? The word is soma, body. Physical body of death, which he earlier identified to have the presence of sin and sin nature. So he's crying out. What is his cry? What is his main cry in verse 24? Save me from my body. <laughs> he never saw that. He was not, okay, save me from hell. He was not saying that. Give me a ticket to heaven. He was not saying that. Save my spirit, let my body die. He was not saying that. Save my mind. He was not saying that. Verse 24, he was saying, save me from my body. Can you see that? It's your Bible and my Bible. Evangelical, look, it's in your Bible. And don't you agree, if that is true, something must be done to the body. Because if nothing is done to the body, no matter what God does, it will be the same struggle as before you were born again. So he said, save me from my body. It was 24. I thank God. Through Jesus Christ. So he is saying, that when Jesus came into his spirit and he's born again in the spirit, he implies something happened to his body. What we call the new body is working. The old body has to die. Then he says, so then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, of, uh, the flesh, the law of sin. So the flesh is still under the law of sin. But something has to take place that save him, arrest or cancel the law of sin working. Remember in the writing of Paul, there were no chapters and verses. Which means chapter 8 is a continuation of the same argument. 
So he continued in chapter 8 to tell us the technical details of how that takes place. In what, chapter 8 was 1. There is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. And where is the law of sin and death working? In the body. I agree. Our spirit is born again. I agree, something happened to our soul that I say equal to new soul working. But isn't it logical as you read the Bible, if sin is in the physical body and the struggle is caused by sin in the body and he says, who will save me from this body? And he says, Jesus Christ. That at the moment you and I were born again, there must be something change in the body. Without that change, you and I will have no power over sin. Something has to be dealt with in the body. And Romans 8 says, it was. Because the spirit now touches and sets you free from the law of sin and death in your body. For what the law could not do because, he agreed, what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. See, the law was powerless because the body of sin was in the flesh. So Romans 8 is not just talking about born again in the spirit. In a sense, Romans 8 is talking about born again, renewal taking place in your body. There is a context to that. And to have that victory, you must also have victory in your mind. That's why he starts talking about the mind. Your mind must have been a new mind. So he says with a new mind, you can set your mind on spiritual things, not on carnal, natural things. Then you will have a spiritual mind with life and peace. And then he goes on. He never left the body because his, the whole problem and conclusion of chapter 7 was the body. So he cured the body in Romans 8 and tells you how to set your body to continue to be renewed into this born-again body. In Romans 8, he says in verse 9, you have to regard that. For with the flesh in verse 8, you cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh. Huh? We are still in the flesh. He says, but you are not in the flesh. His meaning is, something has been done so that your body has changed and you're no more flesh conscious. You're no more dominated by the body of sin. That's what he means by you're not in the flesh. If indeed the Spirit of God now dwells in you. For if anyone does not have the Spirit of God, he is not his. That means when you're born again, you receive the Spirit of God. Verse 10, if Christ is in you, he says, if Christ is in you, something has taken place in your physical body. Yes. What took place? Read. It's your Bible and my Bible we are reading. You are not in the flesh by the Spirit. If anyone doesn't have the Spirit of Christ, it's not his. If Christ is in you, verse 10, the body is dead. Your, 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 your body of sin died. Something changed in our physical body the day we are born again. The power of law and law of sin and death was chopped off. And something is placed inside your body. Whether we feel it or not. The same way, when you're born again, you believe that God is your father and you, are, you have a ticket to heaven. 
you never saw the ticket. You just believe because the Bible says it. So the way to have the newborn again body is the Bible says it, you believe it. Then you experience it. So here it says, the body is dead. Kaput. And if Christ, in verse 10, is in you, the body is dead. But the spirit is life because of righteousness. Yes, your spirit is alive. And if, verse 11, the spirit of him who raised Christ from the dead dwells in you. That means resurrection power is in you. And don't forget what the resurrection power is about. The resurrection power is not just a resurrection in the spirit and soul. It's a resurrection power of the physical body. Jesus did not rise from the dead in spirit or in soul alone. Jesus rose from the dead, spirit, soul, and physically in the body. And if that resurrection power is in you, he says, he who raised Christ on the day, God the Father, the Spirit, will give life to your mortal body, to the Spirit who dwells in you. Which means that from the day the Spirit of God dwells in you, your physical body, the sin is cancelled. <laughs> And your body is receiving transformation. Which means that the longer you let the spirit dwell in you, the more that physical body is transformed. You might ask, why I don't see in many Christians? Because if you don't see the truth, the truth is not yours. If Jesus died for your sicknesses and you don't see it, you are still not healed. If Jesus died for your poverty and you don't see, it's not yours. Jesus died and dwelt in us so that the spirit that dwells in us can transform your body day by day, every day. Resurrection life flow into your body. If you see it, then it's yours. That's how faith works. Today, I pray you see it clearly. That from the day that you were born again, your body is being transformed. Which means the longer you are as a temple of God, every day that you live, you're not growing older, you're growing younger in the Lord because the physical body is, is being conquered by resurrection life and power. That's what he is saying. Life is now flowing not just in your spirit, not just in your soul, but in your physical body. That's the transformation. And he continues to point that this will continue until we become fully resurrected as sons of God, as he says. In verse 19, 18 and 19, he says there's still suffering, there's still persecution, but he says in verse 18 19, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. Now, some, peop some people read this and they read it as some sort of cancelling of the power of the law of sin and death over our life. Full stop. But why stop there? Why stop there? Who told you to stop there? Because Paul never stopped there. It's not just cancelling of the power of the law of sin and death. There is still a renewal going on in our physical body every day by the resurrection power of God dwelling in us as we present our bodies as a living sacrifice every day. And as we behold Him, we mirror God in us. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And as you receive this truth, receive the renewal of your body day by day into the transformation 
of the resurrected body of Jesus Christ. That is the concept of the newborn body. So the next question, is this renewal of the body? Now, I know there's a renewal of the mind. But today our topic is the body. So uh, concentrate on that. Is the renewal of the body really clearly stated in the Bible? Yes. Because look at the simplest verses in Romans chapter 12. Verse 1 and 2. He was understanding this concept of what he's saying and understanding that Paul understood in his theology the continual renewal of the body. He says, present your body. Every day just present your body to be the living temples of God. Present your body as a living sacrifice, holy acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is a good, acceptable, perfect will of God. Now the word here, <coughs> transform, is metamorpho. When the Bible uses metamorpho, does it apply to just the mind alone? Of course, I can accept that it applies to the mind. But is it limited to the mind or does it include the body? In the context of exegesis and studying the use of Greek words, metamorpho, which is M-E-T-A-M-O-R-P-H-O-O, -O, metamorpho, is a transformation that included the physical body. Because that same word. So what he's saying, is he saying that you'll be transformed in your mind by the renewing of your mind? Or is he saying you're transformed physically as your mind is renewed? Look at it. I like to play safe theologically and say include both. It's just like some people say, Galatians 5, 22, 23. Is the fruit of the Spirit capital S or small s? Some will argue, it's the capital S, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Some will argue, it's the fruit, like Hagin will argue, it's the small s, the fruit of the human spirit. I like to say it's both. So the same way, is this metamorpho a transformation of your mind alone or your soul, or does it include the body? I like to believe it includes both. So that he's not just saying, be transformed by the renewal of your mind. That means uh, show forth your new spirit and soul by the renewal of your mind. And then you exclude the physical. I think that's theologically wrong. Here, I believe the transformation include, and to me, especially in the context of all that's going on, that your body is transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now you see why it's important. What you believe will make you become what you are physically. If you believe that you every day grow 10 years old, older physically, and so be it. You will age faster than other people. If you believe in the renewal of you, by this process of the Holy Spirit dwelling in you, so be it. It is as you can receive according to the faith in the Word of God. I believe this transformation includes physical transformation. Why? Because in every place that is used, Matthew 17 verse 2, and he was metamorphosed before them. His face shined like the sun, his clothes became white. That's physical. Mark chapter 9, verse 2. He was metamorphosed before them. His clothes became shining exceedingly white like snow, such as no launderer on earth can, can uh, whiten them. It included even his physical clothes. Metamorphosis includes the concept of physical transformation. That, my friends, is the new body taking over your old physical body. 
And of course, you have using Roman 12, verse 2, which I want to say there's a context to the physical body. Because verse 2, the word metamorpho has to refer to physical body. And because verse 2 is connected to verse 1, verse 1 is presenting your body for what? What do you want to present your body for? The living sacrifice, living sacrifice. Present your body so that your body can be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So it includes that seed of the newborn body. 2 Corinthians 3.18. These are the only times it's used in the New Testament. Be, but we, we unveil face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of God, are being transformed into the same image. I believe that includes physical. Because the context was in line with the, the, uh, the face of Moses shining. And then that was a physical, it says in the Bible, it was a skin of Moses shining like the sun. So I believe it is a physical transformation that's available for us. And I ask the Lord, Lord, well, these verses are powerful. Give me more. Has it been prophesied in the old? And then God showed me something. Look at Ezekiel chapter 36 and 37. Uh, you all know uh, the prophecy, but let's look at it in context. You start from chapter 36 before you go to chapter 37, and then you go to chapter 39. We ask this question Who is this prophecy about, and what is this prophecy? In Ezekiel chapter 36, he said he prophesied to the mountains of Israel, and he prophesied about the land of Israel, and he prophesied about Israel. In verse 16 onwards, he speaks about the renewal of Israel. And he speaks of them coming back. And then in the midst of them coming back, he says in verse 24, I will take you from among the nations, gather you out of all the countries and bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you. You shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness, from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Is this prophecy just only about Israel coming back to their land in 1948, which is fulfilled? Or is there more to it? I believe there's more because Israel was not born again yet. They only physically become a nation. And to, to God, that's a small thing. Although it's a great thing in our natural. Because part of this verse is not fulfilled yet. I don't think Israel has a new heart and a new spirit yet. Although I'm sure the people have been more modernized. I don't see a new heart and new spirit in them. Just one tiny part about them returning to the land. Is this all there is to the prophecy? Or is there more? You and I know Paul took these verses. And also the verses in Jeremiah about God writing the law in their heart, in their mind which took place in Hebrews 8, Hebrews 10, it referred to the New Covenant, we know it also applies to the church. Because for the church that accepted Jesus as Lord, Savior, Messiah, and everything, we got the fullness of it, which includes new heart and new mind. You cannot deny that. It's so clear. So if chapter 36 is about the church, as well as for Israel, right? I want to include them. Then, what is 37? You say, what, what, what is 37? In chapter 37, he brought Ezekiel to the valley of dry bones. Famous story. And then he asked Ezekiel, Son of man, can these bones live? And he knowing that it's God, God knows everything, he says, when God asks a question, he already knows the answer. And he says, oh, God, oh Lord God, you know. And so he's basically saying, you know, oh Adonai Yahweh, you know. Then God says, prophesy to these bones. Ask these bones to hear the word of God. 
Thus says the Lord God to this bone, surely I will cause breath to enter into you. You shall live. I will put sinews in, on you, bring flesh upon you, cover you with skin, put breath in you. You shall live. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesy as I was commanded and the bones started moving. It come together. All the human bones started forming. At first look like skeletons, horror story. But then they began to have flesh, meat, and skin cover them. And they were all complete. They looked human, but there was no life. Now, is this prophecy only about Israel coming together as a nation? which all scholars interpret as that. Like I say, chapter 36 is about Israel coming together, and 37 is about Israel coming together, but there's a due prophecy. There's a part of the prophecy that applies to the church, both in 36 and 37, and later on you see in chapter 38, is still about Israel and the church, because you've got Gog and Magog, which is in our future. So if chapter 38 is about Israel and about the church, chapter 36 is about Israel and about the church, why is chapter 37 only about Israel and not about church? Because scholars couldn't see more. Because they say, I don't know how this applies to the church. That's why. But this is what you can see today. It applies to both Israel coming together and the church. Because the church is represented by, in verse 18, 19, 19, it says, Say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Surely I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and that represents the church, and the tribes of Israel, his companions, I will join them together. This is what Paul say, that the old olive tree and the new wild olive tree is joined together. Jews and Gentiles join together in the Lord. It is about the church. It is also about Israel. And so there was a two-part prophecy. In the first part prophecy, he prophesied and they became a full-fledged human being. But it was not moving. The only time in the whole Bible that that took place was in the creation of Adam. See, in the book of Genesis, there was a due creation, if you can call it. In Genesis chapter 2, in the creation of Adam, it says here, in verse 7, the Lord formed a man out of the dust of the ground. And that was the first part. So when, when he, a man was fully formed, there was no life yet. Then in the second part, God breathed into him. And then man came alive. Adam came alive. Eve didn't come yet. So Eve was included in him. It was a creation of man, a two-part creation. Now, when you look at Ezekiel, as Ezekiel prophesied the first time, all the bones came together, all the bones became flesh, all the bones got skin. It was fully there. But waiting for another part, the second part. And he says in verse 9, up to verse 8, they were like Adam, fully created, but no breath. Verse 9, prophesy to the breath, prophesy son of man and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds of breath, breathe on this land that they may live. So I prophesy as he commanded me, and breath came upon them, and they stood and ex 
great army. And they say, these are the whole of Israel. These are my people. I will put my spirit in you and you shall live. That second breath is God's breath on them and they came alive. It was like a recreation scene reenacted over a whole army of God. I believe the chapter 36, 37, 38 apply to both Israel as well as the church. Now, how does this apply to the church? Scholars don't know, but we know now. It's a prophecy about resurrection life, recreating the, the people of God physically, and this is before the rapture. Such is the mystery of God hidden that you cannot see it. But this is a clear-cut prophecy that we will have a resurrected body like an army of God in the kingdom of God. This equals the kingdom of God on earth. And it's because of this new body that we could rule and reign on the earth greater than all the kingdoms before. Because now it's Christ living through us in a literal sense. Christ reign through us. Now, there's another part. Remember, I talked about the two eagles. One is the eagle uh, gathering of the eagles. The other is the e gathering to the dead body. I call it the division. Now, eagles are a symbol of renewal of youth. When God brought them out in chapter 19, he says, I brought you out like an eagle carrying you, carrying his young. In the Old Testament, uh, the verse there is um, chapter 19. Uh, let me color it for my side. Chapter 19, verse 4, God says to them, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I bore you on wings and brought you to myself. Now, just being born by his wings, and Deuteronomy is just before they cross into the land of Canaan with Joshua and the new generation. So God referred to all his workings with them in the wilderness. God says, I brought you like an eagle. And you know what happened? In Deuteronomy chapter 8, because he brought them as an eagle, he says, though they face uh, the wilderness and they were humble and tested, he says to them, uh, I fed you with manna that you might know that you men shall not live by bread alone, but by every word proceeds out of the mouth of God. That's verse 3. Uh, Deuteronomy 8 verse 3. Now look at verse 4. Your garments did not wear out on you, nor did your foot swell these 40 years. For 40 years, they never had sickness, disease, except those who went against God. They never hungered, God provided for them, because this is a blessing of the eagle. No sickness, no disease. None of the sicknesses and diseases of Egypt will come upon you. In fact, that was the first thing God did for them uh, when, when, when they came out into the promised land. God gave them Jehovah Rapha, his name, Yahweh Rapha, and says, none of the sickness and disease come upon you. Tells them in 14 or 26 of Exodus. And we know from Psalms 103, this is the eager gathering. So God is differentiating the tares and the wheat. The wheat will be resurrected and have resurrected bodies. The tares will continue to destruction. In Psalms 103, talking about the eagle again, he says, Bless the Lord, O my soul. All that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, 
who forgives all your iniquities and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies. Verse 5, who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle's restoration of youth. That is the gathering of the eagles, the living eagles of God. He separates between those who are his. That's why there's so much testing, the purification and holiness required so that you enter into the holiest of holiest with your physical body and are transformed while the tears continue in their destructive ways. Now, one of our favorite scriptures is Isaiah 40, verse 31, about those who wait on the Lord. Do you know it's a prophecy also about our time? Look again at Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40 in verse 31. We all know this verse. Those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary, walk and not fail. Look at how much energy you have. Keep running and running and running, not be weary. One of the fastest creatures uh, that can run uh, the cheetah and they can run at great speeds, but they cannot maintain the great speed. Here, you could keep running and not, you know, not be weary. You can walk and walk and walk and walk and you won't faint. You are better than the young. It says in verse 30, even the youth and the young, they get weary. And even the young fail. But you were not because you got a resurrected body. Now look at the context. What is he talking about? The whole context of chapter 40 is a prophecy of restoration. In the end time. Look. Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people. Speak comfort to Jerusalem. Then verse 3. The new covenant. The voice of one crying in the wilderness. So he's talking about a time after Jesus coming. Because you got John the Baptist come. The voice crying in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked ways make straight. This is John the Baptist's ministry. And upon John the Baptist's ministry, the Lord's breath and the Lord's revelation. He says that uh, the Lord comes. He says, it was, was nigh, O Zion, you who bring good tidings, go up into the high mountains. And to the cities of Judah and say, Behold your God, Jesus came. And behold the Lord, he will stand, shall come with a strong hand. His arm shall rule for him. <clears throat> behold, his reward is with him. And his work before him. This prophesied about Jesus. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. That's our Lord. He shall gather the lambs with his arm. Carry them in his bosom. And all things are judged, all things are calculated. He said, who has directed the Spirit of the Lord? Or, or as his counselor has taught him, on whom shall he take counsel? The Lord himself is the Lord. Behold, the nations, in verse 15, are as a drop in the bucket. And he lifts up the owls as a little thing. All nations before him are as nothing, in verse 17. This is about our Lord Jesus. To whom, in verse 18, will you liken God? Or what likeness will you compare to God? Uh, there's no comparison. Verse 21. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundation of the earth? He... And he continued to say uh, about the Lord. To whom, in verse 25, will you liken me? Or to whom will I be equal to? Except the Lord himself. And uh, then as we believe in the Lord and uh, accept him, he begins to come. What do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? And verse 28, have you not known? Have you not heard? 
the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator, the ends of the earth. Neither faint nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak. To those with no might, he increases strength. That is Jesus and his salvation and his grace. His grace in the new covenant. Even the youth shall faint and not be weary. The young man shall... Uh, hang on, I think looks like there is a bandwidth issue. Yes, uh, Colin, you got to on the video again. It says that you're off the video. I, I dropped out just now off the internet. I'm back and you got to allow yes, me yes. to on the video. Yes, yes. Uh, okay. okay. Uh, sorry, my internet just dropped off while halfway preaching. And uh, I, I you, was... uh, you froze You froze for about a few minutes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, I froze it. Okay, my internet went off. And so, Isaiah 40. It's a prophecy about these end times. Just as Ezekiel 36 and 37 and 38 is. Wow. When the Lord showed all this, I realized there's so much scripture about the new seed of the new born again body that is possible for today. We know, I admit, we never saw it clearly. It's by the grace of God that we are in the end time and God is showing us these new things that as we see in order to receive. Always the word of God about him and the revelation about him must come before we can receive more. And this is the revelation that God gave. That you have a new spirit, a new soul to train and to increase and the seed of the new born again body. There is to be transformed until we are restored to resurrection state where death is swallowed up in the kingdom of God being established. So this kingdom of God is coming. It's more glorious than we realize. There's a transformation of our physical body that is promised to us in the fullness of time. And another way of looking at it is in the book of Hebrews in the book of Hebrews. And when you look at the Hebrew, book of Hebrews in chapter 2, where he talked about the resurrection of Jesus, he wants to not just resurrect himself, he wants to resurrect us in verse 10. For it was fitting for him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory. There's again, the manifestation of the sons of God. Of course, many people very easily push it forward to the rapture or when Jesus comes. But they don't realize this can be applied now. Because one of the biggest things that God has ever done is to remove one of his Ten Commandments. Ah, you said, 
the commandment to keep the Sabbath. It is never given again in the New Testament. Thou shall keep the Sabbath. Disappear. Because, reason number one, Jesus has become our Sabbath. You enter into the final and permanent rest when you enter Jesus, spirit, soul, and body. Reason number two, remember Jesus fully redeemed us from all sin, both from the presence penalty of sin. Jesus will redeem us from all things. The Sabbath was given only after man has to work. And Adam and Eve were told that part of the curse was they will eat by the sweat. That's why you got blood, sweat, and tears today in everything you do. Hard work. Man has to toil for his food and for his daily living. That's a part of the curse. Before the curse came, it was not work. It was enjoyment of life. Everything provided by God. So when the curse came, part of the law Part of the law, when a curse came, part of the law was God provide a Sabbath day to point to the day when we will be redeemed from all the curse of sin. And when Jesus came and took the curse, like in heaven, there is no more Sabbath day in heaven because there is no work. There was, you enter into permanent rest. The meaning of having a day of rest is no more when you don't have work. And thus Jesus fulfill the Sabbath. It's never repeated again in the New Testament. Some keep it as a day to honor the Lord one day. Why? Like Paul says, some of the honor every day. Because it's so new to our theological mind to enter the rest. And part of entering the rest that he talks about in Hebrews 4, he says, there is a special rest, a rest of spirit, soul, and body that even Joshua did not enter into. And it is equal to the rest that God entered. And in verse 9, there remains, chapter 4, Hebrews, there remains a rest. When you enter this rest, in verse 10, you cease from all your works. All your body stop working and start enjoying when you enter into this. And part of entering this rest is verse 12. The word of God is living, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, is a discerner of thoughts and intents of the heart. Look at it. It includes transformation of your spirit, soul, and body. So your spirit, soul, and body enter into the rest. It becomes no need for the Sabbath. Your body, it includes DNA transformation. That's bone and marrow. Remember the bones of Ezekiel 37 that apply today to the resurrected power of God in the new body that he gave to us. And there is this wonderful prophecy that Paul spoke about in Romans chapter 11. I point to that as a concluding conclusion. In chapter 11, he talked about the predestination of God, which we touched on about predestination last Friday. And then he tells us why predestination is necessary is to show forth the fullness of the grace of God. In Romans 11, verse uh, 6. And if it's by grace, it is no longer of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. But if it's of works, it's no longer grace. 
otherwise work is no more work. And God wants to show His grace, which you know, throne of grace is throne of mercy, His mercy. He says the seven days of creation are the, like the seven spirits of God. The seventh day is the spirit of mercy. God wants to show you His fullness of mercy, His fullness of grace. The first day is like peace. God said, let there be light and light and darkness were separated. In the second day, God separated the waters from the waters. So the two parts reflecting each other is like the spirit of love, equal and reflecting the waters above the waters. The third day, God created plant. God called the, called the earth and created land and he filled the land with plants. All of them. The third day, represents joy. Every plant, every tree, if you hear carefully, there is joy flowing. You can burn them down, they keep growing. You can chop them down, they will have seed that keep trying to grow. Joy, like the Ninth Symphony. It's a, it keeps on rising. Circumstances try to drown it. It keeps rising like the tree, like the grass. When mankind leaves a place like they did in Chernobyl, where it's all nuclear radiation, the plants still grow. The third day, joy. The fourth day, the sun, the moon, the stars, all were shining again. They represent the powers of God that rule the night and day. The fifth day represents life. God caused the seas and all that to be filled with life. And there's more life in the seas than today's sea. Even the, when you look at the sea, if there's no fish, there are microplanktons that are producing oxygen for us. Microorganisms that, that are converting sunlight into oxygen, bringing life. So all life in every form, the sea represents life. As abundant as the ocean. On the sixth day, God created the animals and men. And the animals all represent wisdom. All the various wisdom from the insects, the bees, the animals all represent wisdom. The soul is to represent the variations of wisdom of God. And then he created mankind, his personification. We represent all the seven spirits of God. And then on the seventh day, God entered his rest. Everything is to exist by grace and mercy. So predestination is to bring forth the grace of God in fullness that we live and we exist by the grace of God. Now, Paul in chapter 11 says that it is for a time only that God rejected them. And he says here, uh, verse 7, What then? Israel has not obtained what it seeks, but the elect has obtained it, and the rest were blinded. God says, God, God just left them for a moment to go to us Gentiles. And then in verse 11, he says, Have they stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not. But through their fall, Romans 11, 11, through their fall to provoke them to jealousy, salvation came to the Gentiles. And here's a prophecy. If their fall is riches for the world, and their failure reaches for the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. And I speak, Paul says in verse 13, in as much as I'm an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. And this is Paul's revelation in verse 16. Remember the, 
the branch of Joseph added to the branch of Judah. For if the first fruit is holy, the lamb is also holy. If the root is holy, so are the branches. And some of the branches were broken off. And you being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them. And with them became a partaker of the root and fatness of the olive tree. We are now seed of Abraham. We are now the new Israel. We are now the, the spiritual Jews who are circumcised in our heart. And we have all of Abraham's blessing. He says, we are now part of the tree. Do not boast against the branch. But if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. It tells us Gentiles. And you will say, the branches are broken off that I might be grafted in. Well said. Because of unbelief, they were broken off and you stand by faith. Do not be haughty, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, He will not spare you either. Therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God on those who fell. Severity toward you, goodness. Uh, severity, but toward you, goodness. If you continue in His goodness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. And they also, if they continue in unbelief, will be grafted in. If they do not continue, unbelief will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them back in. For if you cut out the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and grafted contrary to nature in the cultivated olive tree, how much more those are natural branches grafted back into the olive tree? Then he began to say, if I do, I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. What is this greatest mystery? Lest you should be wise in your opinion that blindness in part has happened to Gentiles, to Israel. He said, this has happened to Israel because we enter in the time of Gentiles. Until the time of Gentiles is in fullness has come. Then God will go back to Israel and save them again. The deliverer will come out of Zion. He will turn away ungodliness from Jacob and this is my covenant without take away the sin. Concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. Verse 28. Concerning election, they are beloved for the sake of the Father. For the gifts and the callings of God are irrevocable. God hasn't abandoned them. For as you were once disobedient to God, yet have obtained mercy through their disobedience, and listen carefully, even so also have now been disobedient, that through the mercy shown you, they also may attain mercy. For God has committed them all to disobedience and he might have mercy on all. In other words, what he's saying here, that if their rejection by God brought forth mercy unto us, how much more when they come back to God? So he says that if their rejection caused such blessing, how much more when they come back to God? Look at verse 15. What is the blessing? Look at verse 15. If them being cast away cause the world to be reconciled, will not them coming back together be life from death, resurrection life? In other words, the day you see Israel coming back together, 1948, it is the sounding of bells in heaven that say, Israel was rejected that the Gentiles might be reconciled to God. And Israel is now accepted. The Gentiles will go even into higher faith, the resurrection life of God. He says, oh, what a great mystery this is. Can you see that? That from 1948, when, when Israel became a nation, God started pouring His Spirit on the church. We have the 1950s revival of the evangelists. Then the 1960s, churches began to be formed. We have the revival of pastors. Mega church started appearing in the 1960s. Then in the 1970s, teachers started coming forth. Then in the 1980s, Prophets started coming from. 
And in the 1990s, apostles coming forth. And then we reached 2000. We began to enter into the end times. And 2012, finally, the Pergamos glory came about. And Pergamos was taken by the angels of God. And so, the time for the resurrection life of God to come upon his church has come with the restoration of Israel. Oh, how great the mystery of God. Father, we bless you and we thank you for your great grace and mercy and for showing this revelation in our end time that we understand that the transformation of our physical body is a part and parcel of the fullness of the gospel of the kingdom, that the kingdom of God has come. We are your kingdom, and you as king over us live in this temple of a physical body, united and manifested to the earth in the days of the ten toes. We bless you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.